thinking about an item she has bought. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Smart Electricals, Mike speaking. How may I help you today? Ah,、oh, good morning. I'm calling to complain about an item I recently purchased from your company. I'm not happy with it. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'll take you through the company's complaints procedure. I'll need to retrieve your files from our records so that we can discuss the problem properly and find a solution. I'll need to take some details from you first. Is that okay? Okay, but I don't have a lot of time. Will it take long? Not long, madam. Can I first take your name? Yes, it's Susan York. Y O R K E. Okay. Can I have the address, please? Yes, it's flat one, twenty-five Alpine Avenue. That's A L P I N E Avenue, Harchester. The postcode is H A six five L D. Okay. Next, could you give me your telephone number, preferably one that we can call you on during normal working hours? Well, the home one is o one seven three four, five two five two six eight, but you're only likely to catch me on that number in the evenings. I usually have my mobile phone with me during the day, though. It's probably best to take that number then. All right, my mobile number is o seven eight one two double three four five two. And do you have the order reference number on you by any chance? Well, I have the receipt that the camera came with in front of me. Ah, good. Which number is it? It's a bit confusing. It should be the seven-digit number on the top left corner of your invoice. Let me have a look. I need my glasses. Found it. It's D M X eight double four three. Thanks. Now, when did you purchase the item? Well, the camera was delivered last Monday, on the first of February. I ordered it online about two weeks before that, but I can't remember the exact date. If you have another look on the invoice receipt, the date should be there. Oh yes, here it is, January the fifteenth. Okay, I'll make a note of that. So the item is a digital camera. Yes, it's the Aqua PowerShot model in silver. Thank you. Did you take out any kind of insurance when you bought it? Well, no. It was on special offer. I didn't need to pay any extra for the insurance because it came with a special four-star policy. Well, it means you're fully covered for at least another three years. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. What is the problem? Yes, the first thing is that it came with one memory card in the box when there were supposed to be two. Oh dear, I'm terribly sorry about that. It must have been an oversight in the packing department. I can do something about that straight away and get one sent out to you. Well, that's not the only thing. I bought it as a present for my niece because she loves swimming. It said on the website that it was waterproof, 
But when she took it on holiday and tried to use it underwater, it got ruined because water got into the lens. You can imagine how disappointed my niece was. I certainly can. Were those the only problems? No, there was one other thing. It came with a case to protect it. When I opened the box to take the case out, I saw that it had a big scratch on it. We're really sorry about that. I can offer to have the camera repaired for you. In the event that it can't be repaired, we'll send you a replacement. Um, I don't think so. Seeing as it was faulty in the first place, I wouldn't want another one. I think I'd rather have my money back. Can I get a refund? Yes, of course. If you send it back to customer services, I'll make sure it's dealt with. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions 11 to 20. You now have some time to read questions 11 to 20 first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university. So make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area, the place for returned books and other items, is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed Reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on Closed Reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level 2 only. On level 2 are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the Audiovisual Resource Centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audiovisual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. 
You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now, and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the programme where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that, I hear you ask? Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't, but it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists, and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid $1,500 for a stamp design and a further $800 if the committee actually decides to use the design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest. And because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular, or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia. With the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps, no living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about 2,000 ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens. For instance, King Henry VIII, famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Complete the notes made by one of the students present. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to £4 billion a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers, and not a conscious effort to attack someone. But that is perhaps a case of, um, of my being naive or over-hopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points. Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes? Right, off we go. 
Now answer questions 34 to 40. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes made by one of the students present. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is in fact a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management, it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. Sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique, especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now, the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice with offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action. I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced and, perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes? Okay. You've got 20 minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer. But if I lay down and I play dead and I...